Uh, my name is Bing Xu. I'm now working at uh, Suzhou University in China. And today I'll talk about uh, ab initial calculations of uh, some electric properties for several elemental metals. And this work uh, was actually initiated quite some time ago, but uh, only got finished uh, last year. And uh, it was in collaboration with uh, Marco Di Gennaro and uh, Mathieu Vostat from University of Liège. So why do we study elemental metals? Uh, because they can have a normal versus abnormal sign of Seebeck. I'll talk about that in, in a moment. And they can also have a simple versus complex forming surfaces. So by no means the elemental metals are, are trivial and it can be challenging for computations. So here we'll compare two different uh, computational approaches. One is the popular constant relaxation time approximation the CRTA. The other one is the fully ab initial variational approach. Uh, we'll use these two methods to study three alkali metals, lithium, sodium, and potassium. Uh, also four noble metals, uh, copper, silver, gold, and platinum. Uh, just a very brief uh, introduction about the thermoelectric effect. There are two opposite effects. Uh, the Seebeck effect can convert the temperature gradient to an electric field, and the Peltier effect can convert the electric current into a heat current. The thermoelectric efficiency of a material is related to the temperatures of the hot side and cold side, as well as a material dependent quantity called the figure of merit, ZT, which is defined as the electric conductivity times sigma squared times temperature divided by the total thermal conductivity, including the contributions from the lattice and the electrons. And three of the transport coefficients are electronic transport uh, related, and only the lattice thermal conductivity is due to the phonon transport. And in this talk, we'll be focusing on the electronic transport. Uh, I just mentioned there are normal and abnormal sign of the Seebeck. So what does it mean? Uh, let's say we have a normal metal where we have the electrons as charge carriers. And assuming we have a cold temperature on the left side and hot temperature on the right side, the electrons will diffuse from right to left. And uh, if we have an open circuit, the uh, elect negative charges will be accumulating on the left and this will build an electric field that is pointing from right to left. But the temperature gradient is pointing to the right direction. C by coefficient is a ratio of E versus uh, temperature gradient, so C back will be negative in a normal metal. But there are some exceptions. Uh, first, let's look at alkali metals. For alkali metals, they have only one ice valence electron. So you assume it should be a normal metal. And that's indeed the case for sodium and for potassium because their Seebeck are negative. But the major Seebeck in lithium is actually positive. Uh, how about noble metals? For, for these noble metals, they are all actually good conductors. And silver, gold, and copper, they have uh, also field D bands and uh, only S electron for conduction but their C by coefficient is actually positive, which is abnormal. Uh, in platinum, platinum has a uh, Fermi level cross with the S and, and D bands, and it has a more complex Fermi surface, but it has uh, mostly, uh, in, at most temperature, it has a negative C by coefficient, which we can say is a normal metal. In 2014, we studied lithium in, in more details, and uh, we used both the variational approach and the constant RTA to compute the CBAC coefficient. The, the black solid curve is from the variational approach calculated CBAC. As you can see, it agrees uh, quantitatively with the experimental data. But if we take the constant RTA ap approach, uh, it predicts the negative sign, which is strong. So it will be interesting to see how these two approaches work for other elemental metals. Uh, let me briefly go through these two methods so you can see the difference. For bulk material with uh, diffusive uh, transport, 
and the standard approach is to solve the Boltzmann transport equation. On the left side, we have uh, two drift terms due to the temperature gradient and the electric field. On the right side, we have the scattering term can bring the system back to equilibrium. If we take the relaxation time approximation, the scattering term can be approximated as a finite difference, uh, which is the deviation of the distribution function from equilibrium divided by a k-dependent relaxation time, tau k. The calculation of tau k is the most difficult part. It is indeed possible nowadays to do it uh, from ab initio, but uh, it's much simpler if we ignore the k-dependence of the tau and treat it as a constant. This is much more popular. And the other way to solve the Boltzmann equation is uh, through the variational approach. And this approach was uh, entirely derived by Theo Allen in 1978 in this PRB paper. In this approach, the scattering term can be written in terms of uh, scattering operators and uh, function phi k. Uh, phi k measures the deviation from the uh, equilibrium distribution. Uh, in this talk, I will compare the CRDA and the variational approach. Uh, if we use the relaxation time approximation, the Boltzmann equation is very simple to solve. We can define a energy dependent conductivity tensor, sigma epsilon, uh, which is basically the density states uh, weighted by tau k, as well as the, the band velocities. If we ignore the k dependence and uh, treat it as a constant, we can take the tau out, out, outside the, the summation. Uh, with that, we can further derive the transport coefficients, such as the conductivity tensor, which is the energy integral of the sigma uh, epsilon, uh, multiplied by the energy derivative of the Fermi Dirac distribution function. However, uh, with the constant tau k, which is an unknown parameter, so at the end, you can't really uh, fully predict the sigma, but only sigma over tau. But for C by coefficient, it is a ratio of uh, two integrals. So both integral has this sigma epsilon, so the constant tau can be canceled out. Uh, however, uh, constant tau can be canceled out. It doesn't mean the k-dependent tau can be canceled out because it's inside the integral. So this is a big uh, approximation, actually. Uh, this constant relaxation time approximation uh, because you only need to calculate the band energies and band velocities is this uh, rather uh, cheap uh, compared with the elect com uh, more heavy electron phonon coupling calculations. So it's uh, popular and adopt implemented in the both strap and the both one codes. Uh, with a variational approach, Allen proposed the ANSYS that the basis functions are products of uh, Fermi surface harmonics and uh, energy polynomials. And we only need the zeros and the first order polynomials to obtain converged uh, transport coefficients. Uh, with these uh, new basis functions, the scattering operator can be, uh, due to the electron phonon coupling, can be expressed uh, like this, which has contributions from the phonon emission and phonon absorption. Uh, the alpha square f here has a form that is uh, similar to the Elisabeth uh, uh, spectral function for superconductivity. But there's an extra weight coming from the Fermi surface harmonics. And the GKK here is the electron phonon coupling matrix, uh, can be calculated by DFBT method. Uh, the variational approach allows us to further derive the transport coefficients, such as the resistivity and C back, in terms of the scattering operators. And uh, in our approach, we we consider both the intro and interband transitions, and we also consider the Fermi smearing effect. Because without the Fermi smearing effect, we can still calculate the resistivity, but uh, the Seebeck coefficient will be zero. And with this method, with these two methods for constant RTA, we actually combine Abinit with the both trap code to, to guide the Seebeck coefficient. Uh, for the variational approach, everything was done by Abinit, 
uh, for electron phonon coupling calculation, we use the 24 by 24 by 24 K, K grid and the 12 by 12 by 12 Q grid. And uh, they ensure the good convergence. And the transport uh, calculation is done by feeding the input to NNDDB uh, by setting the in input variable uh, IFL transport being, equals, being equal to two. Uh, first, let's look at the results for alkaline metals. Uh, alkaline metals, they have only one ice valence electron. If you look at the Fermi level, they cross with a band that is more or less parabolic, and the Fermi surface are close to spheres. But if we take a closer look for lithium, actually this Fermi level is close to a kink above that. If we if the energy, if the Fermi level actually reached the kink, that means the Fermi surface will touch the point N on the Brillouin zone boundary. Actually, even at uh, this calculated Fermi level, uh, the Fermi surface actually already protruded a little bit towards this uh, end point. But for sodium and potassium, uh, the Fermi level is uh, for the much away from the kink, so it's uh, more spherical. If we look at the density states for lithium there's a strong increase versus energy near the Fermi level. So this is a strong deviation from the parabolic band behavior or nearly free electron behavior. But for sodium and potassium, it is close to linear and is uh, more free electron-like. And then we calculate the resistivity using the, only using the variation approach because the constant RTA cannot give us a, a row without tau. As you can see for lithium, the agreement is very good. For sodium and potassium, the, the resistivity have good agreement at low temperature, but at high temperature, there's some underestimation, especially for potassium. And the bottom three figures are for the Seebach coefficient. And for all the three metals, you see the, the black solid lines are the variational approach calculated Seebach. They have good agreement with the experiment. Uh, for lithium is positive, for sodium and potassium, they are negative. The, the green dashed lines are from the constant RTA approach. For lithium, I mentioned earlier, is it predicts the wrong sign. However, for sodium and potassium, the constant RTA give us the, uh, the right sign, which are negative, but the magnitudes are much underestimated. Uh, next, let's look at the uh, noble metals. Uh, for these renewable metals, they have filled D bands and uh, the Fermi level only cross with the S band. But for this, there's a difference uh, between them and the alkaline metals because the Fermi surface already touched the uh, zone boundary and you see some holes there. And, uh, the density states, if we look at the, in a large energy scale, is rather flat near the, the Fermi level. But if we zoom in a lot, we can see for copper, there's a decrease in density states across the Fermi energy, but for silver and gold, it's more complicated. It's not a monotonous uh, uh, dependence. Uh, this will certainly uh, affect the, the Seebach coefficient and transport. Uh, for resistivity for these three metals, the variational approach, uh, they gave very good agreement with experiments. For gold, because it's a heavy element, so we also consider spin orbit coupling. It doesn't change the result very much. Uh, for the Seebach coefficient in copper, the agreement is very good for both low and high temperatures. For, for silver and gold, the agreement is uh, rather good at low temperature, but the high temperature silver case, it has some underestimation for gold is overestimation. And experimental data may have a small hump at low temperature, which is due to the phonon drag effect, which we don't include in our calculations. And in all three cases, the constant RTA approach uh, wrongly predicts the, the sign of the Seebach. It predicts negative Seebach, but it should be positive. Uh, finally, let's look at the uh, platinum. Platinum uh, has both uh, the Fermi level cross with both S bands and, two, uh, and D bands. And its Fermi surface looks like this. The, the inside uh, right uh, surface, closed surface, is, for, is from the S uh, electron, which is highly distorted compared with the uh, spherical shape. 
and uh, yellow and green colored uh, are the D bands, the D, D band for me surface, D electron for me surface, which is a small electron pocket and a complex uh, D electron network. Uh, if you look at the density states, it's uh, close to a, to a peak of the dust. And we also consider both SOC and without SOC for plenty more. Uh, for resistivity, the agreement is very good with experiment from the variational uh, approach for both either with or without SOC. For C by coefficient, without SOC, the agreement is actually better with the experiment. Uh, including SOC actually overestimate the magnitude. But if we take the constant relaxation time approximation, although platinum has a normal sign of Z-back that is negative, but somehow CRTA predicts the positive sign, which is wrong. Uh, to summarize, uh, we use both variational approach and constant RTA to predict the transport uh, properties of uh, alkali metals and the noble metals. For variational approach, we can predict both the resistivity and c by coefficient. And the agreement is quantitative with the experiment, except a few exceptions. But for constant RTA, it can only uh, fully predict the c by coefficient. And it predicts the run sign of c back for lithium, copper, silver, gold, and platinum. And for sodium potassium, it predicts the correct sign, but uh, the magnitude is, has some significant underestimation. Uh, uh, finally, uh, for future works, uh, we are trying to work on iron. This is a more challenging case because it is uh, ferromagnetic and it may also have contributions from possible spin, spin flip. So <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so there is a bunch of questions. I, I'll, I'll, I'll go through them. But first of all, there, there's a comment by Marc Toron, uh, who says, thanks for the talk. Indeed, it's very late in China. What time is it? Ah. Uh, now it's uh, 11, uh, 17. Yeah, it's, okay. it's a bit late. <laughs> wow. <laughs> OK, there is a Michel Cote uh, asking, is thermal expansion of the lattice taken into account for your resi resistivity results? Uh, for, for one case, for, for gold, we have tried uh, different uh, lattice constants. Uh, we take the experimental thermal expansion. Uh, there is some uh, dependence on the lattice constants for sure, but uh, I didn't show it. I, I don't have this, uh, the, the figure here, but uh, I remember the difference is not that big. There's some difference, yes. OK. Uh, then Xavier Gons asks, uh, how would you include the phonon drag effect? Ah, uh, I think uh, quite some years ago, we considered the uh, approach to do this. I think there's some empirical formula to include the phonon drag effect. It's not fully ab initio, but uh, we, we haven't really started to work, work on it yet. OK, thanks. Um, then uh, Aldo Romero, how are the resistivity values affected by the exchange and correlation? Uh, here we use the, uh, the PBE through the potentials, I think. But uh, I think some time ago, I also tried the different through the potentials in particular for lithium. I think uh, there will be some uh, quantitative difference, but uh, for, the, for the sign of the C bag and the resistivity is uh, pretty robust, I would say. For C bag is a little bit sensitive. Uh, so it, it really depends, I think, because the, the pseudo potential, the exchange correlation function can also change the relaxed uh, lattice parameters. So in, in that sense, it can also affect the result, I think. OK. Uh, then there is another question uh, from Valina Recule. Uh, how do you introduce the temperature in your calculation? Ah, it, it's from the, uh, actually from the distribution function. Like the Fermi direct distribution function, there's temperature there, and this uh, N, I think, is the phonon distribution function also have temperature there. Also, there's temperature here. You see. Mm -hmm. Okay. But but for the band structure and phonons, they are they are zero k band structure and phonons. 
Okay. Uh, then Xavier again, uh, can one can one trust uh, the constant relaxation time approximation at all, given your results? Uh, I think constant uh, RTA actually works uh, pretty okay in many cases, in particular in semiconductors. I don't think many people use it for elemental metals because it's, uh, it's not really a, a semi-electric uh, material. Uh, so I think there are also some uh, improved approaches to not, not just uh, totally a constant tau, but it can have temperature, uh, can have a, for instance, energy dependence or some temperature dependence to, to make it uh, 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 a better approximation. But uh, uh, I think the short answer is uh, it still works and uh, it, because it's rather cheap, so it's uh, good for some either high throughput or some other other ways to quickly filter the uh, good semi-electric materials. Maybe if you need uh, more accurate calculations, uh, maybe you, you can go for some more accurate approaches. Okay, uh, so very quickly, one last technical question about the K-point grids and the Q-point grids that you're using. Oh, okay. So you mean why do we choose this uh, particular K grid and Q grids? Um, I don't it? know. The question is what kind of K point and Q point grids? Ah, we, uh, okay. I, I thought I mentioned it's uh, K grid is 24 and Q grid is 12. Uh, I think it's uh, it, because this method doesn't require a very dense K grid and Q grid. I think some approach uh, uh, does. Uh, we did some convergence tests, as you can see for platinum, which is uh, the most complex case in, in elemental metal selections. And you can see uh, for resistivity and CPEC, uh, we tried the 36 and it's almost identical with 24. So we think it's converged. Okay. Yeah. This is something really clever by Phil Allen because it's a variational approach. So it's super tolerant to crappy convergence. And uh, in the seventies, it was probably really important. <laughs>